How's everybody doing? <laughs> All right, I'm sending the kids to Children's Church up in Adam. is a purple candle, and uh, it symbolizes the love of Christ. God sent his son to the earth to save us. Why? Why? Because he loves us. Okay? And what's an appropriate scripture if you want to talk about the love of God? John 3.16. Okay? For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. But whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In the 17th verse, he didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but what did he do? He sent, but that the world through him, his son, might be saved. Thank you, Luke. And so, we only have one candle left, and what's that one candle? That's the Christ candle, and when do we light that? Tomorrow night, 6.30, you're invited. Bring family, bring, bring friends. Uh, let's just have a good time and uh, celebrate the birth of our Savior. So, you may have came, come this morning expecting a Christmas sermon. <coughs> you're in the wrong place. <coughs> Tomorrow night, I'll have a Christmas sermon. Uh, but for me... The, the cradle and the cross are intertwined. There cannot be a separation between the two. Christ came to die on a cross. That's why he came. That was his mission. That was his father's will. And that's what he did. So for the last time, we are going to be in John chapter 6. After 14 lessons... Today we will finish the sixth chapter of John. And you know, when I, when I teach, what I do is I usually read a chapter at a time, and then I say, well, what does this say to me? And you know, you can look at John chapter six, and a lot of people dissect it in a lot of different ways. And it's a good chapter because it's really uh, just a, it, it's a picture of the life of Jesus Christ in just a couple of days. It's segregated. After this, Jesus will return to Judea to finish his ministry. He's been, up in, he's been up north now for about a year and a half. Okay, This is the end of his Galilean ministry. And when I read this, I saw the most, the most striking thing about John 6 is the end. What happens at the end? This mass of people that are following him everywhere they leave. And what does he say to his disciples? Will you go also? And Peter then uh, uh, utters his words of wisdom. Not often Peter did that, but he did there. So as I looked at this chapter, I said, why? Why were all these people, what happened to them to cause them to walk away? And that's how we've looked at this study in regards to false discipleship because it calls them disciples, does it not? And what does that word mean? They're learners. They're learners, okay? They're learners. So we've looked at this, and I've been carrying on about these characteristics of false disciples, okay? And I want you to remember that these characteristics are still true to this very day. And these aren't all manifested in all false disciples, but they are manifested in false disciples. And first I told you that false disciples are attracted by the crowd. It's happening there, man. You've got to go. They may not necessarily be drawn, drawn by intellectual 
or spiritual reasons, they're drawn because other people are going. Secondly, I told you false disciples are fascinated by a prospect of the supernatural. Promise people something of a supernatural nature, and even if you can't deliver it, they're still going to come and see you. It'll still draw a crowd for you. Thirdly, we saw that after Jesus fed them, they wanted to make him their king. Okay? He created food for them, and that gave evidence of the false discipleship because they only focused on the things of earthly benefit. Give us some more food. Fourth, we saw that unlike disciples, the disciples who saw Jesus walk on the water and get into the boat and then confessed him as the Son of God and worshipped him, false disciples really aren't interested in worship at all. They're not interested in any type of true worship. Fifth, we saw that false disciples seek their own personal satisfaction. After feeding all those people on the countryside that day, they show up the next day, and what do they want? Give us some more food. They want their personal needs met again, just after he had fed them. Six, false disciples make demands on God. They treat God as if he is a cosmic bellhop. Ring the bell, come on God, give me what I want. They treat him like he's a genie. Rub the bottle and he can, he'll grant your wish. Seventh, false disciples are not satisfied with the person of Jesus Christ. They're not satisfied with Jesus for who Jesus is. That what they want from Jesus is what they can get. They don't want him. They want what they can get. And then last week, we looked at their inability to understand divine revelation. That they are, in fact, actually incapable of understanding divine revelation. Last item. I'll finish the chapter with this. We'll start on John 7 next week. False disciples have no interest in embracing the cross. The words in your outline are embracing the cross. False disciples have no interest in embracing the cross. Go to verse 51. John 6. We've been in this, we've been in this 30, 30 verse section here. We've been talking about this section of scripture for about eight or nine weeks exclusively. Verse 51, Jesus says, And the bread that I shall give you is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. That's a new concept. That's the first time he said something. And what has he said new? He's told them previously, I'm the bread of life. You've got to believe in me. If you look back in 36, I'm the bread. You've got to believe. Now he alludes to the bread as it being his, his flesh. This is the first time he introduces the idea, this is my flesh. And clearly, the, the bread then is a symbol because it's a counterpart to the idea of believing. I am the bread. You have to believe in me. In fact, he says in verse 50 that, some, that one may eat of it and not die. You can eat of it and not die. Carrying, he continually carries out this metaphor. 51, if anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. And so he adds this new dimension now, his flesh. And he keeps repeating, listen, do you get the idea that he's repeating the same thing over and over? Guess what? He's repeating the same thing over and over. And he, now he has expanded this to the idea of his flesh. Receiving me, verse 51, the bread also which I give for the life of the world is my flesh, my body. What's he talking about? What's he mean by his flesh? What's he talking about, church? When do we, when do we celebrate <coughs> the body and the blood of Jesus Christ? At the Lord's Supper, okay? What's he talking about? He's making a reference to his death. His sin offering, his sacrifice on the cross. I'll give my flesh for the life 
of this world. And what does he mean of this world? Does it mean that the whole world is going to be saved by the death of Jesus Christ? No, it doesn't. That would be a universalism thought. So what he does mean is that the, the world only has how many saviors? One. One. I am that savior. I will give my life for the world. I'll give my flesh for the world. That's the only offering that can bring the world <laughs> salvation. The world has no other provision in the world for eternal life. There's no other salvation by any other name than Jesus Christ. I'll give my flesh for the life of the world. And you must eat my flesh. You must eat my flesh. You know, that th this chapter is what ended up in the Roman Mass. This is how the Roman Mass was born. Uh, it's been convoluted in the Roman Mass. But the idea, you have to be, listen, why use, why use the metaphor, eat my flesh? Because you must take me in. Why drink my blood? Because you must take me in, okay? Now, if you say to somebody, you come up to somebody, and you say, hey, man, I got something I need to talk about. And I, listen, this is important. I need to talk, talk to you about something that's just extremely, extremely important. You know, when I, I got saved at 38, I got out of the Air Force when I was 39. You should have seen my employees for one year. Before I got saved, my employees ran away from me when I walked into the commissary <laughs> because I was such a stinker. Probably 85 to 90 percent of the time I was hungover, and I didn't feel good, and they weren't either. But after I got saved, they all ran from me for another reason. <laughs> Because I had to talk to him about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I had to talk to him about Jesus Christ. I, I would do anything to talk to him about Jesus Christ. And I would tell him, man, i got to talk to you about something that's really, really, really important. And if you'll try to understand this, it can change your entire life. Now, it's not going to be easy for you to understand it, but you're just going to have to trust it. You're going to have to believe it. You're going to have to have faith in it. But if you'll understand it, this can change your family's life, your family family's life. This can change everything <coughs> if you'll only believe. That's what Jesus is saying in chapter 6 of John. If you'll only believe, if you'll understand, you know, he's not telling them that they have to eat him. He's telling them something that they are totally capable of understanding. He's saying if you want to get to that next level, if you want to be a child of God, you're going to have to partake of this. He's simply saying metaphorically, symbolically, embrace me. You have to acknowledge me. And that's what he's saying here. It isn't that, you, you know... He says, he's already spoke to the idea that he's the pre-existent bread. Come down from heaven. Very purposefully. Why? Because he's speaking to them of his, his deity. He speaks to him. He speaks about him being the provision of his father. He wants them to understand, I'm deity, and I'm fulfilling my father's will by doing what I'm doing. I want you to accept me as the only one that can supply eternal life. But you have to be willing to take me in. You have to be willing to eat my flesh. And in that, you have to be willing to accept my death. Now, if you're a good Jew, and you go up to a good Jew, and you tell a good Jew, you have, to, you have a Messiah that's going to die, they're not going to buy into it. It's going to be very hard for them to buy into it. The Jews, a good Jew, had no room for a crucified, and your outline of the word is a crucified Messiah. Why? Because
because the Jews' picture of the Messiah is riding in a, on a white horse with a sword, conquering all the enemies of, of Judea and, and uh, occupying a throne in Jerusalem. This is not what we signed up for when we signed up for a Messiah. That's why in Luke 24, Jesus is walking down the road to Emmaus, and these guys, he's trying to talk to them, and these, these guys aren't really understanding him, and he says, hold on, I'm going to take you back into what we would call the Old Testament, and I'm going to show you why it is necessary for the Messiah to suffer and die. Listen, folks, this is a hinge in of Christianity. It's a simple metaphor. You have to be able to accept my death. And, he, and as I said, he keeps repeating it. He doesn't really advance it beyond this point, but he keeps repeating it over and over. And the Jews, what do they do? Diaguzo. Remember? Diaguzo. They begin to mumble and grumble and mutter. Really, what they do is they mock him. As he repeats it over and over, they begin to mock him. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Get serious. How can that ever happen? So Jesus says to them, Most assuredly I say it to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will have no life in you. Some people will say, well, they didn't understand. Yes, they did. By now, listen. Have you ever listened to a rabbi teach? Have you ever listened to a rabbi teach? Have you? <coughs> Speaks in metaphors all the time. Always using symbolic pictures to paint a bigger picture. They knew by now what he spoke of. Rabbis speak that way all the time. They would have been familiar with that, especially the leaders. That's the way they spoke. And they're the ones that lead the rebellion to lead the people to walk away. You've got to be willing to accept the sacrifice of my flesh and the shedding of my blood to embrace the cross. Verse 54, it's shocking news to them, but he says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise them up at the last day to eternal life. Verse 55, my flesh is food indeed, my blood is drink indeed. Verse 56, he who eats my blood and drinks my, who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Do you think he's, do you really think after considering the teachings of Leviticus 17, he's entertaining the idea that they need, need to become cannibals? Get serious. They know what he's talking about. In order to come into unison with Christ, you have to be willing to accept his atoning death. You have to be willing to accept that he offered his body as sacrifice for sin and shed his blood as the one who was executed in, my, in our place. Verse 57, as the living father sent me, again, speaking to his preexistence, and I, because of the father, again, speaking to performing in his father's will. So he who feeds on me and live, will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead, making a reference to Moses in the wilderness in the manna. He who eats this bread will live forever. The bottom line is that false disciples have no real interest in embracing the cross. They may want to wear one, can wear one around your neck. They may have one on their t-shirt, okay? But now they're not willing to accept the fullness of the gospel of the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Not willing to accept the reality of the atonement. And what is the atonement? What's the doctrine of atonement? A foundational truth of our of what we believe at New Life Family Worship Center? That Christ died on the cross for our sins. Okay? And in this way, he fulfilled the old covenant sacrificial system. 
He became the sacrifice once and forever. And by that sacrifice, we are then reconciled to God, a life changer. That's what we believe that the cross represents. And that's the point. And the evidence here is clear. Some of the disciples say, what do they say in verse 60? This is, this is hard to understand. They're still mocking. This is hard to understand. They understand what's going on. And then what do they do? They grumble. They mumble. They stumble. Verse 66. Adios. They leave. So, why? <laughs> why? Why are false disciples disinterested in the atonement of Jesus Christ? Amen. Because false disciples do not hunger for righteousness. A false disciple is not hungry for holiness. A false disciple does not seek forgiveness. A false disciple is not being slaughtered in their conscience. A false disciple does not feel the fury and the weight of divine judgment hanging over their head. After all, why would a false disciple feel those things? Because false disciples already have all the answers. I know I was one. You could ask me anything, and I would educate you. See, the false disciple really is already satisfied with what the world can give them. The false disciple only wants what they want, what their will can give them. Jesus said he didn't come into the world to call the righteous. Why? Why? They ain't coming. <laughs> They're already righteous. They're not coming. They already know. They're, they don't need anything else. I've already got what I need. I don't need anything else. I love talking to intelligent people. I'm not one of them. So that's why I like to talk to them. And you'll talk to them about the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they'll tell you, well, that just doesn't make any sense. Well, that's the entire point. It doesn't make any sense. This is a miracle. This is, this is God. It ain't going to make no sense to our feeble mind. But, right, but false disciples aren't hungry and thirsty for righteousness because they already think they have everything. But once a person, listen, once a person is broken over their sin, once a person is shattered by their lost condition, and they begin to understand the eternal consequences, once a person feels that hole in their heart that I filled up with drugs and alcohol and all the other things of the world, for years upon year, once a person begins to long for peace and for joy and for love and for hope and to escape the everlasting punishment of hell, then that person will come and they will be ready to eat. Amen? Amen? Amen. You know, Christ may be presented to people in his heavenly glory. And they may respect his person. And they may look at him and admire his beauty. And they may, may be touched by his love and by his kindness. And they may be awed by his power. And they may even shed a few tears over the way he was mistreated. But, but, it is only when you see Jesus Christ as the only hope for your forgiveness by the sacrifice of himself on the cross that people will come to him. False disciples will not come on those terms. True disciples 
will. What does Peter say? <coughs> Jesus says, do you want to leave also? Peter says, to whom shall we go? You know the words of eternal life. We've come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Listen, beloved, today in churches all over America, there's a whole bunch of people that are interested. They're drawn by crowds. They're fascinated by the supernatural. They're desirous of earthly things. They're indifferent towards real worship. They like to be entertained. They seek only the personal satisfaction. They want a God who will meet their demands. They have no desire for a real relationship with him. They have no understanding of his truth his word. They have no hunger for his repentance and his righteousness. Because all of those things require that they turn to the cross. That's the only way. So, 14 lessons in John 6. What lesson is this? In the book of John, what's the front cover say? How many? 85 lessons. 14 lessons I spent in one chapter. After all these lessons, today's question is, what kind of disciple are you? Why are you here today? Give me my review slide, Mr. Zander. False disciples cannot embrace the cross of Jesus Christ. They stumble. That's why uh, Paul wrote it in 1 Corinthians 1. They stumble over the cross. They couldn't accept the idea of the death of a Messiah. And they were always, listen, you could ask a scribe, you could ask a Pharisee who was the most righteous person they knew. And oftentimes they would admit that it was themselves. What kind of disciple are you today? A personal inventory. What kind of disciple are you today? What is it that you seek at the house of God today? Have you come to put him in his rightful place on the throne of your heart? Are you still keeping things for yourself? You can have this, you can have that, but I'm sorry, I can't give you this. That's what the altar's for. That's why we do a time where we give you the opportunity for the Lord to speak to your heart. And that's what we're going to do now. If you would stand with me. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we... Uh, we lift up this time to you. We pray, Lord, for, for hearts. I pray, Lord, today that there would not be one heart left here today. That when we leave here today, when our feet exit this building today, that there would not be one heart that would leave without a Lord and Savior residing in that soul. What better time of year to acknowledge Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior than this time when we celebrate his birth? <gasps> what better time, what better moment than this to give him our all? And Lord, we're getting close to another year. And Father, I just pray for, for those that are in the body that are saved, Lord. I pray for them that they'll lay down those burdens that they've been carrying for this past year 
and they'll give them to you, and then they'll leave them at the altar and not pick them up again, which is so often our habit. So, Lord, we give this time to you. We pray for each and every heart here. We pray, Lord, for those that may need prayer at the altar, those that need to speak with me, counsel, man, woman. We, we can bring up other elders, elders' wives, whatever the need might be. Uh, uh, scriptural baptism, membership, Lord, any of those things. We want to give this time to you. And, Lord, we're going we're gonna to sing this song. We're going to let this song work on our hearts. What child is this? Well, this is the child that came into this world to die for us. And we pray all this, Lord, in Jesus' holy name. What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap with sleeping, whom angels greet with anthem sweet, while shepherds watch our express our love for you and your family. We want you to know New Life Family Worship Center loves you. We care about you. Uh, we wish you the very, very best this Christmas season. Uh, we pray that uh, we'll see you in the new year. Don't, uh, don't allow uh, Dan, are you trying to keep all the presents? Some things don't surprise me. Uh, we just pray for your safety, your security, your spiritual walk. We pray that the Lord will give you ample opportunity to share 
his, uh, his blessing in your life. And uh, remember to pray for your church. Remember to pray for your pastor. Uh, pastors need prayer, at least if not more than other folks. So remember that. Amen. I mean that. And then, uh, as is our tradition, I believe we have two birthdays this upcoming week. We have Jason Mayfield, who is not amongst us. And then, I believe, we have Valerie Miller. Is that true, Doug? That is true. Is, are there any other birthdays this week? Nobody? Amen. <laughs> the biggest one. We're going to say happy birthday to Jesus tomorrow night, if I remember. Uh, any? 5.30 tomorrow night, if you've got kids coming to sing. So come see the kids sing. It'll, it'll mean a lot to the kids. And, you know, we, we did a, when I ran a, the school district in Clovis, Every year we did a grand Christmas program across the Christian school district. We began work the week we started school. Our art department did all the drop backdrops. And it was a, a grandiose affair. And sometimes it went perfect, and sometimes it didn't. But you know what? It was always really good. So come see the kids. They'll appreciate it. OK, let's all stand. Let's sing happy birthday to Miss Valerie. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Miss Valerie. Happy birthday to you. Thanks for coming. God bless you. All right. Good to see all you guys. So uh, thank you for being here. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for this time. And we just, we just pray for those that can't be here. We pray for especially people that just are end up away from home. And the military people are away from home. The, just different people. We have, you, you know, you have people driving trucks and across countries and just different things. So we pray for them because it can be hard on them. And we pray for a lot of those that are having difficult times now with family and things like that. But Christ, we know that you have you have that peace for us and help us to show that to, to other people and, and just remember how blessed we are that that you are for us and that you died for us and that you were born for us. We're so blessed. So we just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.